Uh, well, good morning once again. Uh, it's an honor to be sharing with all of you today. And as I pre- thought about what to preach about today and really prayed into it, I felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit to talk about the dynamics of, of, of power. And this is kind of a risk, uh, because if I, I don't know if you're all aware, but there's a, an election happening, you know, in just a couple of days. Uh, so I want to say a couple of things up front, especially for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, get to know real well, so you know my heart in all of this. And so first, I want to strongly encourage all of you who can to exercise your constitutional right to vote. Dan's been talking over the last couple of weeks. Many Christians don't choose to vote. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing the consequences of this play out in our society. Now, while there's no such thing as a a perfect candidate, right, you know, we encourage you all to, to pray about it, to talk to people who are close to you, especially other Christians. Um, Talk to them about what you're thinking and then cast your ballot for where you feel God is leading you. So that's first. Second, one of the things that I love about being part of a church community is that our core beliefs and our mission do not change based on who the political figures in office are. No matter who wins, we still need to make disciples. We still need to keep the commandments. We still need to care for one another. And we still need to love others as God loves us. And I'll just say this last thing, that I think the devil loves it when we get consumed by political arguments. I think he loves this time of year. He loves it every four years. Because they distract us from the real battle. And the real battle is this, light against dark, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness, truth versus lies, Life versus anti-life. So we're going to keep this frame in mind as we dive into the message today. And we're going to start in sort of a fun way. I'm going to ask you to put your thinking caps on for just a minute and consider the key question that is on the slide. What would you do if you had the power to do anything that you wanted? And I think that this is one of those questions that's Uh, both a little tempting and a little bit scary at the same time, isn't it? I I think we'd all like to think that we'd use that power for good, but could we always guarantee that that would be the case? Some of you may recall that there was a movie that used a similar question as this one, as its premise. Anybody remember the movie? Bruce Almighty? Anyone see that? Yeah. Movie's 20 years old. Can you believe that? like over 20 years old. But when we're thinking about movies, I wanted to do another, or a quick poll. By show of hands, how many of you have seen the first Marvel Avengers movie that came out in 2012? This is the one where Loki, the guy with the, like the really large helmet and the horns, right? Uh, he was the primary villain. So a couple of you have seen it. Um, if you haven't seen it, no problem, I'll get you caught up. But there's a scene in the movie that inspired the title of today's sermon. And in that scene, the bad guy, Loki, has been captured by the good guys. Those are the Avengers. And in the scene, Loki is being confronted by the person who put the Avengers team together, a guy named Nick Fury. And they have an exchange that goes like this. And if you'll pardon me here, I'm going to do my best Loki impersonation here. So, how desperate are you? that you call on such lost creatures to defend you. And Nick Fury responds, you threaten my world with war, you steal a force you can't hope to control, you talk about peace, you kill because it's fun. And Loki responds, it burns you to have come so close, to have power, unlimited power. And for what? A warm light for all my mankind to share? And then to be reminded what real power is. Now, I've probably viewed that scene at least 10 times before, but it's only recently that I'm coming to see that it is not an interplay between two characters, but as the 
great battle between God and the devil. For example, consider this question. How desperate are you that you call on such lost creatures to defend you? I can't help but think that that's what the devil thinks about us, that we're lost creatures, that we're broken in all kinds of ways and trying our very best to follow what God is asking us to do and partner with him to bring, our, to bring his kingdom to earth, but still, well, you know, only human. But can't you just imagine God saying something back like, well, you threaten my world with war. You steal a force that you can't help to control, you talk about keep peace, you kill because it's fun. And then the enemy turns around and he mocks God about that mission while bragging about his ways and that they are what real power is all about. Now, if you've been with us the last several weeks, you know that we've been in the book of Daniel and there's going to be a couple of stories that we're going to revisit as part of the sermon today. But I think it's worth pointing out how cool it is that the passages that we're going to take another look at have some different layers to them that tie into our sermon today. But if this is your first time uh, here or you started coming in the middle of our No Compromise series, don't worry. Um, I'm going to get you caught up once again. But I also encourage you to visit the link that's on the slide and check out our sermon archive to come up to speed on what we've been learning about the life of Daniel. Regardless, what I'm going to do, because we're going to be on a journey today, um, I'm going to do a little bit of paraphrasing of these stories to save time. And I'm going to put the places where you can reread these accounts for yourselves up on the screen. Okay? Sound good? All right. So the first story we're going to talk about can be found in Daniel chapter 1. Here we get a description of the current state of things. The nation of Judah has been conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Um, they, uh, uh, Daniel and, and his three friends, who were named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were made slaves. Yet, somehow all four of those guys found favor with the king, and they did this as young people. Some of that, like you saw the, the, yellow, the uh, purple shirts running around, people that age. And in the story, Daniel refuses to defile himself by eating the king's foods. And the scripture actually says, And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the eunuchs were the people helping to administrate the kingdom. And there was this test allowed where Daniel was, was to eat nothing but vegetables for 10 days. And then when the test was over, Daniel and his friends uh, appeared healthier than everyone else. Which, I, I don't know if any of you, like, I've tried eating nothing but vegetables for 10 days. I would have been pretty weak. <laughs> I'm a carnivore. I like, I, I like uh, mixing some meat in there. But the chapter closes by talking about how these four individuals were great in wisdom and understanding, saying that King Nebuchadnezzar found them to be 10 times better than the magicians and enchanters in his kingdom, so the other wise people in the kingdom. But I want to pause here and think about what was at stake for a moment. Daniel and his friends, they were slaves, effectively, right? They're essentially just boys. But they were in this position that I would imagine would have been the envy of just about anybody in the nation of Judah, right? They're not having to do hard labor. They had the privilege of eating at the king's table. They had positions of influence. But yet, even despite their seeming low, seemingly low status, they were the ones dictating terms. And they were doing it to the most powerful empire on earth at the time. God sees to their health, and he does it to such a high degree that it was noticeable with just, just within a week and a half. Some of you know that, like, struggle with the, right? A week and a half is not a long time. And they were found to be healthier than everybody else. And what's more, they were seen as 10 times more gifted and more wise than anybody else in the kingdom. 
So what I see in this story is an empire has the biggest army, access to nearly limitless resources and talent, serves the fanciest foods, and none of those things ultimately mattered. Babylonians weren't the ones with real power in this story, were they? Now, the second account we're going to look at is another story that many of us were taught as children, and it's found in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel. It's where King Nebuchadnezzar is infuriated with Daniel's friends because they won't bow down and worship the 90-foot idol that he had made. Nebuchadnezzar even threatens to throw them in a furnace to be burned alive because of their refusal. But look at how they answered the king. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. And so the king, what, else, what, what choice did he have? But to have the men bound. But he was so mad that he had the furnace heated up to be seven times hotter than normal. And in fact, it was so hot that the army guys who had to throw Daniel's three friends in the furnace ended up being consumed by the flames themselves. But here, but what happened? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they all lived. And what's more, let's take a look at this passage. And it says, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, And set aside the king's command. Blessed the people who set aside the king's command. The people who disobeyed. And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god. Except. Or uh, except their own god. And then the king. Promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the province of Babylon. So. Here are three men who openly defied the most powerful ruler in the world, and they refused to worship his God. They said there were, they had no need to answer him about it, and they were thrown in the furnace because of their beliefs. But because they stood firm in their faith, not only did they not get consumed by the fire, but the king himself declared the glory of the Lord and promoted these guys. And so we see the king's desires and his authority, even his ability to declare consequences for disobedience. They amounted to nothing. He didn't have real power. The last account from Daniel we're going to look at this morning is from chapter 4, which is a chapter we've only touched on briefly in our No Compromise series. But in this passage... King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he's at it again. This time he has a dream that nobody can interpret except for one guy, Daniel. And Daniel tells the king what the dream means, and it's a judgment. The text indicates that the the king was sinning at the time. So he was going to be driven from the presence of humanity to go live with the wild animals and quote-unquote eat grass like the ox. Yum. And so one day, Nebuchadnezzar is on the roof of the palace, and he says this to himself. Is this not, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? <laughs> and in that moment, judgment comes. The judgment Daniel pr- pronounced on him came, comes true, and the prideful Nebuchadnezzar was driven from men to eat grass like an ox. He even ended up looking like a wild beast during the time of his exile. The text actually says, his hair grew as long as the eagle's feathers, his nails were like bird's claws. 
But chapter 4 ends with Nebuchadnezzar eventually repenting and coming back to his senses. And then he praises and honors God and sees his kingdom restored. But I want us to all notice something about the scripture I just read. Nebuchadnezzar bragged about his own power, mighty power, and majesty. (laughs) But where did that power get him? A trip to the wilderness to go eat grass like a beast? It would seem he needed to learn yet another lesson about real power. As we continue our No Compromise series, we're going to learn about many more incredible things that happened in Daniel's lifetime. But the accounts we've just talked about will cover a reality that we really ought to pay attention to. And it's a key idea for this sermon. Real power is not revealed in power as the world defines it. Such as the amount of territory you have, the size of your army, your access to resources, your title, your ability to tell people what to do, your ability to deliver consequences for disobedience, or even what you've accomplished. That leaves us with a gap, a question about what is real power. It's here we're going to shift out of the book of Daniel and start looking at the life of Jesus for some answers. And we're going to start in Luke chapter 4, where we find a direct confrontation between Jesus and his enemy, the devil, our enemy passage goes like this, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, you are the son of God, or if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Okay, so let's spend a a couple of minutes taking a closer look at a couple of things in the passage we just read for a few minutes. So first, I want you to notice that the devil says something very important twice. If you are the son of God. He says it in verse 3. He says it in verse 9. So in other words, what he's saying is, if if you say you have a title, you say you have power, prove it by demonstrating it. (laughs) Jesus wasn't having any of it. To use power in that way would have been to use it for himself. That was not his mission. And if you look at his life, you see a pattern play out over and over and over again. His power was constantly being used in the service of others. To heal, to teach, to cast out evil spirits, to empower, to encourage, and ultimately to sacrifice himself for the redemption of the whole world. And so we come to another key idea for this sermon it's that real power is not meant to be used for yourself. But there's another aspect to this temptation account I wanted to highlight, and it's found in this passage, where it says, And the devil took him up 
and showed him, Jesus, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you, I will give all this authority in their glory, for it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. The devil is trying to get Jesus to make a deal, to trade the authority and glory he'd held since the fall of man in chapter 3 of Genesis. He's trying to get Jesus to make an exchange for worship from the Son of God. But I think this passage should say something about the value that the devil placed on what he'd attained and held since his deception. That authority and glory of all the kingdoms in the world was of less value to him than receiving worship. Less value. And Jesus' response to him is telling, and Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him, and him only shall you serve. In this passage, Jesus reveals another truth about real power. It is making a choice to worship the Lord your God and serving him only. So it's not about making trades. It's not about taking shortcuts. It's not about making compromises. It's about holding on to that which is most valuable and also being confident in your decision as Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel were. Deuteronomy 6.5 instructs us this way in a section called The Greatest Commandment where it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. But there's another interesting translation of this scripture that I like a little bit better. And it's from our friends in the Orthodox tradition. And it reads like this. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, from your whole soul, and from your whole power. I find it interesting that if you look at other parts of Jesus' life, you'll find a dynamic that plays out pretty consistently. On the one hand, he was always attracting these big, large crowds, and he was teaching, and he was healing, and he was encouraging people. But on the other hand, there were the leaders, the religious leaders. And they didn't quite fare so well. For example, in Luke 6, the Pharisees found themselves on the end of a rebuke twice. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples, this is Jesus' disciples, plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered him, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And also gave it to those with him. And he, Jesus, said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In another passage, and then on another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might find a reason to accuse him. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save the life or destroy it? And after looking around at them all, or after looking at, all, at them all, he said to them, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they, the Pharisees, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Notice their reaction to Jesus. Fury. There's another example of Jesus uh, talking about the Pharisees where he says in Luke 12, verse 1, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Not to put too fine a point on it. But Jesus didn't limit his criticisms to the Pharisees either. Look at what he says in Matthew 22, verse 9. 
Here he's talking to the Sadducees, and it goes like this. Jesus said to them, the Sadducees, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Ouch. And I think it's important to just remember and realize that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they, they weren't the, considered the evil people at the time. They were the religious authorities. Pharisees representing the middle class, Sadducees, you know, they were kind of the elite. They're the upper crust. They were in charge of the temple. Because of their roles, you may assume that they had the highest levels of God's favor, the ones who were loving God from their whole hearts and from their souls and power. But the passages we just read show that that is not the case. Something was wrong, and Jesus really didn't mince words when he talked about it. And he said to, him, said to them, the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Or how about this passage? And in the hearing of all the people... So this wasn't a private de declaration. Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and in the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. I want you to notice some of the words that Jesus is using here. Abomination. Condemnation. I, aren't these words that we kind of associate with people outside of the church instead of in it? What was happening was these religious leaders, they all had titles. They had authority, but they did not have real power which is walking in the ways of God. They were instead, they were abusing the status they held and they did it fully knowing what they should be doing and then not doing it themselves. And because of that, they stood in a judgment seat. But let's come out of the past and jump into our present day. It is heartbreaking to see how those with power and authority are abusing the positions they have the same way that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. And look at the consequences. Politicians and other leaders with zero accountability. Greed running out of control. School systems that are failing our children. Lies about what will make you happy. It's why workplace bullies end up simply moving on to terrorize another organization. And why employee satisfaction is at an all-time low. And it's why the demand for mental health services is at an all-time high. And thank God for everybody in that, position, in, that, in that profession. In other words, many people in charge, they forget the words of Jesus that say, for what is exalted among men is an abomination before God. But this is why the series we've been in that's called no compromise is so important. It's because I see all the time how worldly power tries to get real power to make deals. Because here's the reality. Real power smashes worldly power every single time. And the devil knows it. So what he tries to do is get you to believe that you are not powerful through some of his favorite strategies, lying and deception. He wants you to see yourselves as weak. He wants you to see yourself as somehow wrong for what you believe. He perverts justice. He twists facts. All with the goal of getting you to make an agreement that standing in real power is insufficient. And in doing so, we are tempted to repeat the same mistakes Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden the ones that let the devil seize control and gain dominion in the world. You know, that very power he was willing to trade back to Jesus in exchange for worship. 
Only this time, he's trying to gain dominion in your lives. But we're not here to make deals, are we? In Luke 10, Jesus says this. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah, devil. You remember those lost creatures? They have the power power to overcome all your power. We as believers and followers of Jesus have been given authority and power to overcome the power of the enemy. But it, it, So it's not about being a king. Nor is it about doing what the world says is okay or what someone's title is. It's about real power. The power of God working in our lives for the benefit of others. Without shame, without wavering, without compromise. And we do this in several ways, which takes us to the action steps I have for this sermon. And the first one is to press into discernment by asking God how he'd like you to use the power and authority you've been granted each and every day through prayer. Because here's the deal. The world's uh, kind of a confusing place. It's got distortions and distractions. And it's often hard to know what's real and what's not. So we sit on the sidelines kind of paralyzed and unable to know exactly what it is that we're supposed to do. So here's a short prayer you can pray. And we placed it at the bottom of the notes page in your bulletin. So you don't have to like scramble to try and write it down or take a picture of it. But it goes like this. Lord, where would you like me to use the power and authority you've granted me to advance your kingdom today. I pray against the schemes of the enemy to distract me and pull me off course. And I pray that you would grant me the courage to act in what you're asking me to do, even in the face of opposition. Give me the clarity I need to act boldly for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. The next action step I have for you is to pray for everyone you know to use the power and authority they've been granted well, especially those who are in leadership positions, and regardless of whether or not you like them. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dan shared this wisdom from the Apostle Paul. First of all, then, I I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. From experience, I can tell you that those in leadership positions face intense spiritual warfare. The devil hates godly leaders, hates them. And so the attacks can be intense at times. Criticism, unceasing. I've seen people with good intentions compromise and completely lose their way. I have seen fear used to control and lies used to avoid accountability. And the devil loves all of it. But what if God touches the heart of somebody who is lost and they repent? This is what Paul is trying to get us to see, that we have the power to pray in such a way that we see real courage, real change, and real power manifesting in our leaders. So let's do that and see what God does. After all, can you imagine what our leaders would look like without prayer? And the last action step I have for you is to use your real power in the service of others. We have to realize that as Christians, our God is alive and he is active in our lives. 
Each and every one of you needs to see yourselves as powerful. So spread love where there is hate. Bring joy where there is sadness. Peace where there is conflict. Kindness and gentleness where there is hurt. Faithfulness where there is falling away. Patience and self-control when people are losing it. Encouragement where there is hopelessness. Provision where there is emptiness. For within the virtues I just mentioned lies the essence of our real power. And they cannot be squelched unless we let them be. And any external force who tries is going to look like a fool. But when we do the types of things that we've just talked about as action steps, we exercise real power, the things that God created us for, to defeat the works of the devil, and to truly make an impact for the kingdom of God and his glory. And we can do these things regardless of who wins the election. Let me pray and close this out. God, I thank you for this message. I thank you for how you were present during the preparation of it. And I pray that it touched the hearts of each and every person within the sound of my voice today. God, help us to see ourselves as powerful because we are acting in your power and completely and totally committed to you and your ways. God, give us the courage to do what you're calling us to do and give us the strength to overcome the schemes of the enemy. We love you, Jesus, and we look to you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.